Wyeth is an anthropologist of technology, finishing his PhD in the history of science department at Harvard, and he writes and teaches about the future visions of biotechnology farming in cities. Right now, he's researching how agricultural tech startups are trying to disrupt the food economy and change how we think about plants and buildings. Previously, he taught at Harvard and in the English department at Brooklyn College. He's curated art and science exhibitions and events about de designing living things, and he's going to speak to us about how futurists have imagined utopian cities on Mars covering the entire planet and right here in the five boroughs. So I'm very excited to welcome Wythe Marshall back. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm short, and I'm just going to hold the mic. Um, yeah, so uh, today, instead of trying to review all 100 odd um, slides that I'd, I'd picked out. I'm just going to focus on a few cases and think about cities as technologies and think about um, particularly sort of what cities do as opposed to just urban environments. So if an urban environment is dense and built, we might say the city is more of a social technology. It's a place where people congregate. And so uh, visionaries who think about what cities might do in the future, what they should do, I think uh, tend to sort of revolve around a few specific goals. So we have uh, five of them I'm going to go through with a bunch of different examples jumping forward uh, from the Enlightenment on. And I'm not endorsing any of them, and I'm picking sort of um, bangers for a reason. But uh, So to start with, uh, coordinating knowledge, power, and capital. I think that in the beginning, a lot of big cities like New York were envisioned as just central administrative districts. And you really see this with the commissioner's plan. There are three big-time founding father types who hired uh, this guy, John Randall, who went all throughout Manhattan and got arrested and got cabbages thrown at him and just Google him. He's a very interesting historical figure. Uh, but he laid out the grid. So you can't really see it this well in the original map by William Bridges, but uh, they basically decided in 1811 to make Manhattan the way it is today. Except they were going to have a central park called the Grand Parade, uh, which over time just shrank to uh, what is now, I think, Madison Park. It's much, much smaller. Uh, but there was a fight really throughout the 1830s on what price you could put onto green spaces in the city. So that's one way in which central administrators, urban elites, um, began to, even among themselves, sort of talk about uh, their, their own rational visions for what good cities would be and had a lot of disagreements about how much real estate you want to sell versus how many parks you have so that you can actually breathe the air and get away from the, uh, really the horse shit. That was the major problem at the time. Um, jump forward a, a hundred years and you get uh, sort of the end of high modernism, the, the birth of postmodernism, and a smart young Dutch architect who uh, really turned to New York and did a lot of work just showing that New York and later other cities uh, were really headed in a, in a place where they would be subdivided in these little compartmentalized districts um, that would be massively unequal. And I think it's interesting to see this work from the 70s and it's sort of a low point in urban utopianism when people thought cities were dangerous and full of crime. Uh, you still had these visionaries who later, now, you know, he's sort of associated with cultural industry and uh, makes a lot of money selling buildings, um, but really na hit the nail on the head in terms of some of the trends we're seeing today. And I think we've actually entered, uh, not in New York, but, but elsewhere, this kind of Rococo phase of central planning, which is the this phenomenon of ghost cities, or the better term I really like is this photographer, uh, Kai Kamara, and I, I definitely suggest you check out his work, Unborn Cities. So the idea that the Chinese government is building gigantic cities and there's no one in them. And then they actually give out tickets that say, you can go to an apartment in this place you've never been and live there for free. And so people travel, and they, they now are filling in the cities. But uh, he went around for a few months to, for his first book and just basically took pictures last year of these giant, mega, beautiful cities that are completely empty. And uh, his website's full of great examples. This is just one. Um, now, at the same time that uh, urban elites, uh, people with money, uh, people producing knowledge in universities, and people with political power wanted administrative capitals or really market capitals like London and New York, they also wanted to balance how much city they had to deal with because it's the city, again, full of the Irish and horseshit and other, you know, things like that. Um, so the, you also get this utopia, uh, utopian vision of, of not having a city at all. So Thomas More's utopia, the original utopia, uh, limited cities to about, I can't remember if it's 6,000 or 60,000, but it's not very many people. Uh, and there's very strict ideas about where you can go. So wherever you're from, you really can't leave without a passport, and you're not really supposed to leave. Uh, so they're, they're really from the beginning of urban utopianism is this fear, um, again, among sort of the elite writers who are thinking very abstractly about populations moving around and getting too dense. Here, uh, we jump forward again to uh, the Victorian period, and, and just afterwards, we have Ebenezer Howard, who's sort of a failed farmer from England who comes to the United States and goes back, and he proposes an idea that actually gets taken on, and they, these cities are built, garden cities, um, throughout the UK and the US. So uh, this is an idea of having cities that don't really get bigger, 
than 250,000 people. Uh, but they're arrayed a certain distance apart from one another, and they're arrayed a certain distance apart from forests, farms, canals. Um, insane asylums are located f as far away as possible, but not too far, because you know, you'd want to get there if something happened, I guess. Um, epileptic homes, uh, the brick makers. So sort of all the undesirable things are in between the cities, and then the cities have these kind of rings, so each of the colors corresponds to you. Know, there's a whole complicated scheme, and there's beautiful, beautiful diagrams. And this book was a bestseller, basically. So um, over th you know, the course of the the early 20th century. Uh, and you know, part of Howard's genius, and this is true, you could say, of Lake Obisier, we won't be looking at, but is just really good design. So all of his images of cities imagine these very, very abstract circles that you could plump down anywhere. These aren't real cities, but they became real. It's uh, so like Reston, Virginia was built on this plan. Um, and now the most famous figure in American architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright, actually. So he's known for a lot of things, one of which is really gigantic skyscrapers that were never built in New York, these cathedrals. He talked a lot about the future of religion. Um, he also really didn't like cities and thought that eventually we'd get to a point where the government would just distribute land equally. So when you became 18, you'd get an acre of land and there'd be no skyscrapers because everyone would have their own acre. So you could farm, you could have a house. Sounds great, right? I mean, if you're a libertarian who hates other people. Um, but this was predicated on uh, one interesting thing, which was also the government would give you a personal helicopter because uh, <laughs> petrol was becoming so cheap and uh, transportation networks were advancing so rapidly that basically that just seemed to him to be imminent. Like within his lifetime, we'd go from train to car to better car to drone helicopter situation, which you can see with these little UFOs that are personal flying vehicles. Um, so I just thought that was kind of surprising of Frankie at the end. Uh, okay, so one of my favorite, and I think understudied for some reason in, in American history of architecture, but figures is Constant uh, Neuvenhuis, who just went by Constant, because, you know, with that last name, um, who worked for 20 years from 1954 to 1974 on a project called New Babylon. And New Babylon, this is meant, these are giant cities. This is like the size of Paris. New Babylon was the idea that soon, soon enough, right, where he starts in the 50s, goes through the whole 60s and 70s, uh, the earth would just be covered in buildings. And automation would proceed, so we wouldn't have to work. We actually couldn't work, because machines are better. And transportation would be so efficient that he imagined something like the Hyperloop. So he didn't call it the Hyperloop. He called it light rail that's very fast and cheap. But he describes the Hyperloop. Um, same with self-driving cars, so we don't have car parks. So what he decided is, man, what, is, what do you do if you're an architect and that happens? I mean, so people don't need to work. They don't need to drive. They don't need to park cars, because the cars drive themselves and are never stopping. And he realized that the problem was leisure. And what happens if Marxist uh, revolution happens and we all don't have to work and we all are equal, um, then really it's all about designing new forms of leisure. So man becomes, instead of homo faber, the man the maker, you become homo ludens, the, the, the human who is just playing around. And so he designed these sectors that kind of float above existing infrastructure just to cross the whole earth. And he thought everyone would be nomads. No one would stay in one place. And this was a very, very popular vision of the time. So a contemporary of his, Jonah Friedman, had a, a similar idea which was more based on making stuff like New Babylon, but leaving existing Paris and New York below, whereas Constant never shows the existing. It's always just this kind of desert. Yona always sort of implies this is, you know, Broadway, and you just build a new flying city on top of it. This influences the metabolis a little later on. An early image here from Arata Sasaki is City in the Air, which, I mean, there's many images of this, these sort of giant megastructures that are associated with a liberatory leftist politics and with urban renewal, but urban renewal qua the entire s planet is a giant city. Uh, so I've cut all the slides from anime, where, but that's a whole genre of anime. It's like just the planet is a giant city. Um, and obviously that goes back to Isaac Asimov and Star Wars is a city planet, but these guys really were proposing. I mean, these are major architects. Um, Super Studio, they get the, the English and Italians had their own movements like this, and this is towards the end of this sort of um, birth of postmodernism phase. They, they had uh, this one project that's kind of funny that's enshrined at MoMA, where they imagine one giant monument stretching across the whole world. Um, and this is, they're making fun of, at this point, Constant, who also was making fun of his own work and moving on. But I think part of the logic there is like, what would a liberatory politics actually look like? Like, what would it even look like if we won? And um, part of the problem that sort of existed since this moment is no one really knows the answer to that. No one has a convincing answer, because living in a, in a place like this or this doesn't seem that appealing to most people. So we'll talk about some of the other options that come up with controlling the environment. So uh, it's actually kind of hard to control the environment. It's hard to automate everything. However, eventually, if we could, we sort of arrive at it from the, the, the other direction. So the sort of libertarian strain, the Stuart Brand folks, if we just treat plants like computers and we get better at engineering computers and engineering plants, and we can go to space. 
And this was true, this is a, the, the most prominent illustrator, by the way, in the Soviet Union was Andrei Sokolov, and you can Google his name and see, he did like thousands of these giant, beautiful paintings of space stations. Uh, and then here are the two guys who got hired by NASA in the early 70s to work on what it would really be like if we built a habitable space station. And so this is uh, Rick Gitas and Don Davis. And they worked together on these designs and presented them at Princeton and elsewhere. And they had a lot of traction and sort of influenced this sort of Epcot futurism that we still associate today, I think, with this particular time. Um, but what, it, in a way, it's saying is you'd have total control, and what you'd do with it is you'd go to another place. You'd leave the Earth behind. We don't even know what's happening on the Earth in this imagined future. Imagine near future, by the way. This was supposed to be 50 years from 1975 or something, so about now. Uh, and we're pretty far away, obviously, um, and we still have a lot of problems on Earth. So it's sort of interesting. They're not talking in these images about fixing up things like climate disruption, desertification. They're just sort of, uh, you know, doing some construction work on the Taurus. Um, probably one of the most influential urban utopias in terms of fiction has been the Mars Trilogy by Kim Stanley Robinson. Some of y'all might have read it. And I think it's really interesting how in the, the last book he assumes that some people get to Mercury and live in the Terminator Zone, which is actually what they call the line dividing the, the too hot side that's by the sun and the too cold side that's away from the sun. And uh, they build a city that moves around. So this is drawing on Archigram and Archizum's work on what if cities were just you know, moving themselves instead of the constant thing of you're moving between cities on a hyperloop, but same difference. Um, so there's a sort of dream of nomadism on both sides. There's a sort of right intonation and left intonation that, that both agree that we might want to go somewhere else if we really could. However, in our day, this is from this year, the sort of version that we're left with is a little bit meager to me. When you compare this techno-utopianism being presented at Princeton to NASA, to a startup that most people are suspicious of today, it's like, okay, you can eat lettuce and you can go for a walk and that's, <laughs> you can play on your phone, I guess. I mean, it's kind of like just having a really small apartment in the winter here, I guess. Um, so there's another intonation of that, however, and so I'm going to end on a j more joyful note, which is, uh, so what happens if we really take into account this idea of living in an eco-city? So, okay, most people, this is the boring statistic, but most people, as of a couple years ago, live in cities, not otherwise. By 2050, it'll be about 70% of the population, I think the FAO and other organizations think. Uh, and the population will move to a, a little beyond 9 billion and maybe plateau there. No one's really sure. It might mean doubling our food output. It might mean only increasing by another 70%, but... Um, Regardless of the statistics, it might be helpful if we did that in a way that didn't completely screw us over environmentally. So if you go back, some of the first people who talked about what it would really mean to live with plants indoors were uh, John and Nancy Todd are very influential. They worked with Buckminster Fuller. And this idea of the dome comes from Fuller, but they were really applying it in a sort of pragmatic way. How do you actually grow fish and plants together in Cape Cod and then Prince Edward Island and California where they're from and Arcosanti? where Paulo Soleri is a uh, sort of futurist architect, wanted them to design a whole village and how would you grow food in these tiered mountain to desert uh, microclimates. And it's really interesting because uh, Fuller, one of his first projects out when he failed out of, the, of Harvard and failed out of the Navy was he got in the domes and sold everybody in the dome and became a very, very famous scientist. And he wanted to dome over Manhattan. So going all the way back to that grid, he just said the way you would save all of these big companies in Midtown money is by controlling their microclimates with a giant geodesic dome. And it sounded in 1960 so insane. Everyone sort of laughed at him and said, okay, Bucky, you know, go build a dome for Disney. Um, but in some ways, this is really what we're moving toward today with uh, sort of using these designs that were coming from a place of utopian sort of hippie ideas about working with nature or using science to do something socially good. But we're now looking at them, and I'll, I'll sort of end on this note, in terms of actually saving a lot of money. Um, so what I mostly do is research people who are interested in vertical farming and sort of involved in that world. And these are just a few visions from uh, the more recent side of things that are, I mean, obviously utopian in their rendering. I mean, all sort of architects use this kind of, I mean, they're not going to show you an ugly building. But here, it's not just a farm on Roosevelt Island that looks like a dragonfly. It's got like a million birds. All the birds in the tri-state area have descended on it. <laughs> Uh, and I just think that's very lovely. It's like not something I think I see in a lot of, of other renderings is an attention to not just non-humans qua the green stuff, but just wouldn't a lot of birds and pollinators probably also like a sort of mixed indoor-outdoor uh, vertical farm. This is a proposal. This is meant to be a tower, so this is just one ring, but there'd be lots and lots of rings like this for how you could really grow a lot of food, have food sovereignty in Hong Kong. I don't know that China's going to invest in this, but I thought it was an interesting project. 
um, and pretty well thought. And then a similar one from the same year, actually, that I also don't think is going to get built as it is, but might inspire um, similar projects to get funded in Seoul, where you have a mix of outdoor and fully indoor growth in the city. So there's definitely a lot of attention more and more by all kinds of uh, different urban planners, uh, policymakers in the city level, and certainly would be urban farmers to this question of how do you use some of these goofy ideas from an earlier regime um, and actually you know, make money with them. So um, leaving on a, on a really positive note is right before Labor Day, uh, I got a chance to go atop the Parks and Rec Sustainability Center building on Randall's Island, and they have this gigantic green roof. The whole place is green roof, and most of it's edible, and they have tomatoes and watermelons and whatnot. You can go, uh, they have free beekeeping classes every Saturday, I don't know. But uh, they're greening lots, of, they're greening all the city, rec centers, sort of all the municipal buildings one by one. And I think in some ways they're, they're not very good at telling the public about this because um, they work mostly, I think, to get bigger companies to green roofs um, when they're developing new whatever luxury condos. But uh, I think it's really great that we can live in a city where some of our tax money is actually spent uh, not just providing you know, a space for pollinators, which is like nice, but who cares, but really lowering energy bills and really changing uh, the way that sort of heat bubbles get trapped uh, in urban environments. So it's not just sort of about that building, but it's it, in general, if people treated their buildings like living things that participated in a bigger organic ecosystem, we might have a different effect. So um, there, I'm happy to talk about lots of, of uh, things here. This guy's hilarious. Oh, it's kind of cut off, but Married to the Sea. I don't know if you guys didn't read that webcomic. But uh, yeah, I just want to end on the note that I think in general, all kinds of urban utopias tend to fall into these two categories of centralized management and just bigger is better, or a kind of uh, Benjaminian celebration of chaos and the synergy that comes from encounters with the random. And the idea that when you walk through a city, you're forced to meet people who aren't like you, who you don't know, and maybe have just market encounters. You just buy a coffee from them without stealing it or punching them or being like, fuck your coffee. Um, Maybe you even have a night, you say nice coffee or thank you. It doesn't really matter, but this, the city makes you do that over and over again. So that is the spirit of cosmopolitanism and humaneness. And I think it's really telling that last week when the president is talking about kicking out people who've lived their whole life here, most of them now in cities, uh, you know, we might want to really gauge our desires and think about th these sort of imaginaries that have tracked over hundreds of years and different people have used pieces of to, to sell buildings and develop again, mostly in New York luxury condos. Um, but, but think about the effect that cities can have as technologies. They can either be technologies for isolating money and power and sort of protecting it and making more of it in one place, or they can also, I think, be powerful uh, systems, powerful technologies for getting groups of people to interact with one another peacefully in a pretty dense area. And I think that's going to be more and more important going forward in the future. So not to make any hard predictions, but I will predict uh, you know, getting along is good and weird shapes are good. So uh, if you have more questions, Happy to talk about uh, you know the history of architecture or especially plants. Yes. That's a great question. I have a list. Oh no, I don't need airplay to access. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, we can just hang out one second while I'm just going through. Um, besides Reston, I mean, I know the, that that's one example, and there are more in the UK, but, you know, I'll tweet it later. Um, I don't know where in my notes I put the, the list, but the, one of the main things is that these cities actually, um, they, they're not necessarily a bad idea. They don't differ that much from what Jane Jacobs said uh, 50 to 60 years later about mixed use and about the value of having some green space, some area for kids to play, along with some, obviously, workspace, some economic engine. But um, she really got a lot more aggressive with the details, like broad sidewalks and how much different that, that makes. Whereas Howard's still looking from this very top-down central planning level where it's really about how far do you put the insane asylums outside of town. So it's a, it's a much more 19th century paternalistic uh, mode, but in, you know, it's not wrong to say that people want a mix of town and country, whatever that means. I think that means different things in different generations, and depending where you are. Uh, but certainly, I think in New York, for example, you see that with maybe even um, green roofs and certainly just parks and community garden initiatives, bringing in a little bit of the sort of perceived non-city into the city being a good thing. Hi. Hello. Uh, Of this stuff, of course, influences you know writers and, and uh, filmmakers. 
they're like a, um, and it's great because when you see it in a film, you get to see people living in it, and like the audio visual one. Is there one that you uh, are, are a fan of, is like a movie or something that we may have seen, that, and if so, like which one? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I definitely think, weirdly, the sci-fi show The Expanse, which is kind of a medium cheap uh, adaptation of a pretty good uh, political thriller near future science fiction set throughout the inner solar system, um, does a good job of showing how non-human living things, not non-animal non-human living things, um, so plants and algae, would actually work and how you might live with them and the importance of uh, still farms. So for example, there's a whole arc, not spoiler alert, but there's... <laughs> you know, a, a vertical farm station on one of Saturn's moons that then becomes important. And it's not really, it's not important in terms of, like the show's not about farming, it's about spies and aliens. But uh, but it's interesting that they take that very seriously. It's like, well, what do the people eat who live near Jupiter or Saturn? Like it'd be really far to ship them stuff from Earth, so they need to sort of think that through. And I think they do a good job of building that in in a subtle way throughout the show. But there, there's many, I mean, uh, most contemporary science fiction, if you look at even something weird like Interstellar, which was a mashup of three kind of classic science fiction texts, and has this sort of tacked on bookend about corn and climate disruption, and there's like the angry bro relative who's like, why don't you just help me grow corn and not save the world? And Matthew McConaughey is like, I don't even like corn or whatever, you know, whatever that <laughs> problem is. It's interesting that that's the frame for this big movie that they got, you know, Kip Thorne from MIT and, and uh, or wherever he was. You know, they, they got all these people involved in um, to think through. And I think just that that actual um, faces, the idea that there, there's a sort of signal saying, hey, plants are important. And the fact that plants are responding to what we do is important. And thinking about that feedback loop is something that I, I don't think it's going to go away. Um, if you're asking for recommendations, my favorite literature, and I'm sure all, all of its option will soon be adapted into probably crappy movies, but um, Paolo Bacchi Galupi is kind of the big guy in like biopunk or ecopunk. So he has a number of books that explore different visions of what I'm talking about. And uh, certainly the new, oh, I don't, I just literally forgot the slides. But I was going to show the sort of ironic jump from the Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars trilogy in the 90s to today when Kim Stanley Robinson is writing about future New York. I think it's called New York 2140. But I haven't actually read it yet. But you should go, the cover is amazing. It's a drowned New York where the the, the roofs are all f farms, but it, and people live sort of in between. But it's it's sort of what will happen if we don't build a seawall. And but it still assumes New York's an important metropolitan center. But it, it's sort of you know it, it's not I wouldn't say apocalyptic, but it's definitely not like uh, not, not necessarily utopian. Um, I mean I'll have to read read it and find out. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, uh, no, thanks. I, I don't know that I have the best perspective as an, a cultural anthropologist studying tech startups in New York and, and elsewhere. Um, <laughs> but focusing on plants, I mean, I definitely think people are eating more plants. This is the, the, there was a food dive article the other day, you know, millennials are actually eating their vegetables. Ha, we had a pun and a clickbait headline. But it's true. I mean, all the statistics bear that out. And uh, people are, care more about where their food comes from. So for one just simple thing that would mean if you wanted to eat locally or hyper-locally, um, you might see more production in cities. So whether that looks more like an outdoor urban farm, uh, community-supported agriculture, or whether that looks like these high-tech, uh, you know, like the, the, the two I showed you from sort of, or three from higher-end architecture groups bit, looking for giant million-dollar city bids to do these towers. Um, it might be some mix. It might never get to the tower state. It might always be smaller scale. But I think uh, there definitely seems to be a growing interest in uh, where food comes from, and that'll drive some change. In terms of sort of urban repair and renewal. I definitely think climate disruption is the major narrative, and we see this this week, again, not to be a downer, but with um, Harvey, Katya, Irma, and now Jose, and just the idea that what what would, does good architecture look like changes when you destabilize the a priori. So if you get a flat desert, or if you get existing cities but everyone's willing to move, then you can do these 60s, 70s utopian mega cities, and everyone doesn't have to work, and they're just like drinking a latte, reading a book. But in real life, you get, you know, Haiti wiped out over and over again, and what do you design for when you have a limited budget, and the UN's like, here's $100,000 and some shipping containers. I mean, how do you build houses out of that? So I think you're gonna see a lot more of upcycling because it's the best way probably to address some of these problems. But again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a policy advocate. I'm not, a, I'm not an architect or anything, so. Um, all right, thanks, so I guess, uh, I guess I'm getting kicked off. Thank you guys so much. Uh, looking forward to the other two speakers.